thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, to be able to talk at this TED conference. I, I really love talking about astronomy, as you will see. You can go to the first slide, please. Oh, I have to do this, excuse me. <laughs> one of the most amazing things about cosmology and, and astronomy is one of the simplest observations you can make is that the night sky is black. Now, we're all used to this. When the sun goes down, the night sky is dark. But this is actually the most profound observation you can make in cosmology, in astronomy, that the sky is black. This tells us immediately that the universe is finite. This goes back many centuries of, of philosophers and scientists who, who dreamed about this. Perhaps the person who put it first on the most scientific footing, curiously enough, was Edgar Allan Poe, who went through the mathematics of why the night, dark night sky proves that the universe is finite. Let me explain it to you a little bit. It's very easy to understand. It's called Olber's paradox. You can imagine yourself going down a road and looking at, at the trees on the side of the road. And if the trees are rather thin, you can see the sky between the trees. But as the trees get thicker and thicker, as you look closer to the horizon, you see less and less sky until at some point, you no longer can see the sky through the trees. Because at that point, every direction you look, you will see either a branch or a leaf or a tree. Well, the same thing happens in the night sky. When I look at the night sky, if the universe was infinite, in every direction I would look, there would be a star. And although that star may be very, very small, inside the disk of the star would be as bright as the sun. So if you imagine every pixel in the sky, every point in the sky would have a star in it, and that star would be just as bright as the sun. And that means if the universe is infinite, that is, if the, such as the forest is very, very deep, the whole sky should be as bright as the sun at night. At the daytime, it'll be the same way. So just the mere fact the night sky is dark shows us that the universe is finite. And that's a profound idea. Now, I'm a cosmologist. I study the origin, evolution, and, and future of the universe. But really what I do is I measure how bright stuff is, I measure how far stuff is away, and I measure how hot it is and how fast it's moving. And I've been very, very lucky to be part of a story of modern cosmology, where in the last 20 years, we've discovered that almost the whole universe we can't see directly with light. And I'd like to explain that very, very quickly. If I take a, a rock and I drop it right now, it'll fall down and hit the Earth. And be given the size of the Earth and how much, um, how much matter there is, that's going to tell me how fast the object falls. If there's more matter, the object is going to fall faster. I don't have to see the whole Earth to notice that. I can measure the mass of the Earth if I know how far away we are from the center just by how fast stuff falls. Same thing happens in galaxies. I can count up the number of stars in this particular galaxy, roughly, and estimate how much mass there is because I know how big stars are. But I can also measure the mass of the galaxy by following a star or another galaxy or something falling into the galaxy. And just like the Earth, when I do that calculation, it turns out the galaxy has much, much more mass than by counting stars. There's mass that's missing, and we call this dark matter. Similarly, you can see in the corner here a, uh, a bright star-like object. This is an exploding star, a supernova. And we use supernovae to measure distances in the universe. Now, what we discovered in 1998, again, was something rather simple. We know the age of the universe is 13 billion years old. We know how fast the galaxies are moving apart from each other. So velocity and time, multiply them together, and you get distance. So just from those facts, I should be able to tell you what the distance to the galaxy is. When we actually measured the distance based on those exploding stars, the galaxy was much farther away than it should be, which means that there was something that was pushing the universe apart that was, had overcome normal gravity. And this is what we call dark energy. Now, there are so many videos you can see on TED and, and books and so forth talking about dark energy and dark matter. And it is mysterious, but I think it should be less mysterious than we think it is because just because we can't see it doesn't mean that we don't know it's there directly. After all, if I see a flag in the distance flapping in the wind, I know there's wind even though I can't see it. And I know how fast the wind is based on how fast the, the, the flag is, is, is flapping. Similarly, if I'm in a car and I'm driving down the road and then suddenly I feel a force against me, my first reaction is that there's probably a wind gust and I'll look to both sides of the, of the car and I can see the grass or the trees bent in a certain direction. I feel the force of a wind that I don't see, and yet it's part of my daily life. Well, 
Dark matter and dark energy are unusual aspects of the universe, but just because we don't see them directly, just like we don't see the wind, doesn't mean that we don't see their effects of pushing around galaxies and stars and other things in our universe. We see those effects directly, but we don't know yet what dark matter and dark energy are. They compromise 99% of the universe that we don't see. Only half a percent of the universe is you and me. They're all the stars we see, everything in our universe, that's only half a percent and everything else is missing. Well, that's as much of the cosmology as I want to get to because instead of talking about the cosmology, I want to talk about the, the future of our universe, in particular, saving our universe, which sounds like a strange concept. Let's go back 500 years to Ferdinand Magellan. He and his crew attempted to go around the Earth. Of course, he didn't make it, but about five of his crew members came back on one boat to Victoria, I believe, after a few years. And what they proved was not that the Earth was round. We knew the Earth was round. What they proved is that there was a technology at that point to be able to discover everything on the surface of the Earth. It was dangerous at that time, but it took only a few hundred years before explorers explored all of the Earth and found all the mountains and all of the rivers and so forth. What they showed was that the, the Earth was technologically finite. Well, after 500 years, we know that the Earth has problems. Now put yourself in the position of a cook on Magellan's ship and suppose you're peeling potatoes. You're not going to take the, the, peel, the, the peels and put them in a corner for compost like we would today. What you're going to do is you're going to go up and throw them into the ocean because after all the ocean is unbelievably big. You can throw as much garbage in there as you want. But it's taken only us only 500 years to come to the point where we can't throw our garbage into the earth anymore. This is a plat, uh, plot from the IPCC of the increase in carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide over the last 2,000 years. You just look at that, and that is frightening. This is what we're doing to our atmosphere. Similarly, if you look down on Earth at night, this is what you see. There's light everywhere. 62% of the people on Earth do not live where it's dark. 99% of the people in the United States and in Europe do not live in a place where they can go where it's dark. We live with lights. We've polluted our planet with lights. And that may not seem like a big thing, but now it's being discovered that light pollution perhaps can really affect our health and perhaps even be, be part of problems that we have with cancer. Here's a picture of the Earth from the NASA Orbital Space Debris, debris Program of all the space junk that they found so far. And you can, see it, you can see the big circle around the Earth, that's the geosynchronous orbit. You can't even see the Earth in this diagram because it's just completely cluttered with space junk, bolts, other stuff, gloves, whatever. We have lots of stuff up there so that when you go up in, in a spacecraft, it is dangerous because you can get hit by this stuff. We've managed to pollute the environment around our planet in 500 years. I don't know why most people have never seen this picture, but like we have the pictures of the globe, we now have pictures of the universe. This is a picture of the universe. Now, we're not outside watching it rotate, but this is the universe. The universe is finite. In the last two decades, we have discovered that we have the technology to, to be able to, to find all the galaxies in our universe. I can take a big telescope and point it in some part of the sky, and I literally see to the end of the universe, and beyond it, there's blackness. Now we're building big telescopes that in the next couple of decades will map out essentially every galaxy in the universe. There are a couple hundred billion of them, so there's gonna be something like Google Universe, certainly, where you can go with your cursor and, and explore any galaxy in the universe you want. But you can store the coordinates of all the galaxies in the universe on your iPod. So the universe has become technologically finite to us. It's only taken us 500 years for the universe to become technologically fi finite. Now, of course, the universe is, is immensely big, so we can just throw our stuff out into space, of course, and nothing is gonna happen. But it only took 500 years for that not to be the true, true for the Earth. Well, one thing we can do, which is a possibility, is that we could create another universe inside our own universe, which would tremendously affect the way we live and probably destroy our universe. But that's way in the future, but the physics says that it's possible. But what I want to end this talk on is something else, in that the universe is not just science and technology. It is, what we, when we look up in the sky, 
we see a lot more than stars. We see a reflection of our souls, and this goes throughout humanity. The sky is not just a place we put satellites. It is a heritage, a patrimony of, of humanity. All cultures look at the sky and look to see, see for gods. They look, they look up in love. They look up in so many different ways. It's something we all share. This is a lovely poem by Rumi about opening the window and coming face to face with the moon. Pablo Neruda, the great Chilean poet, also wrote about the sky. An inf infinitesimal being drunk with a great starry void, likeness, image of my mystery felt by myself, a pure part of the abyss. When we look at the night sky, we also look at the night sky as human beings. And that night sky we look at is not the night sky filled with satellites and space debris, it's the night sky that we, lo we look at when we see stars and so forth. The night sky is a repository of, of the history of humanity. In the case of, of, the, of Western humanity, all the stars have, have Arabic names from the, from, the t from the time of the great Arab astronomers. The constellation Greek names, which date back to, to Babylon. It's a mixture of large numbers of our, our history that is written in the sky. And peoples all over the world look at the sky and, and read stories in the stars. It's, it's part of our soul to look at the sky to try to figure out who we are. Perhaps the culture that is most concentrated in their, their love and their being part of the sky are the Aboriginal peoples of Australia and New Zealand. Here's a painting by, by a modern artist showing the relationship between the culture and the stars. Very, very beautiful work. So, most of you know this quote from President Eisenhower about the military industrial complex and how we have to worry about it. But what most of you don't know is in the rest of the speech, there was another phrase which is equally as poignant and perhaps even more applicable to today. And that's this part. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that the public policy and it could itself become the cap captive of a scientific technological elite. Well, we're here in TED, and if there's any definition of who is part of this scientific technological elite, it's us. We are driving technology. We're driving the way the Earth is behaving. For instance, if you go to Times Square, we have all sorts of technology that allows you to put all these advertisements on Times Square, and there's not a whole lot of control over it. And this is what happens when human beings with technology without any control, and you can barely see the night sky here. What really frightens me is in the next couple of decades, there is no, way, no reason why we're not gonna have space billboards. There's no law against space billboards except in the United States. Now this is an artist's conception of what could happen, but it only takes one, one mile of mylar in low Earth orbit to be the size of the full moon. And so instead of going outside and watching the, the rising moon with your, the person you love, you can now, in maybe in 10 or 20 years, watch the rising of the Chick-fil-A billboard. It's, this is what our future can be if we don't do something about the skies because otherwise technology is completely unbridled because us, us as part of the scientific technological elite have the capability to do this and we are going to do it unless we hold something more dear in the skies above us. So two last things. William Shakespeare also wrote about the sky, doubt thou, the stars are on fire, doubt that the sun doth move, doubt the truth be a liar, but never doubt that I love. The poets, the, the artists, look to the sky and find a reflection of our emotions. In the next couple of decades, we are at the cusp of perhaps losing <coughs> that part of the sky and our ability to look up and feel our emotions reflected back at us. So I wanna end, end this once again by a picture of the universe. This is our universe. We're in the center, every one of the little white dots is a galaxy that was discovered with a small telescope in New Mexico. It's much more filled out now, but this is the best representation. The thing that you see on the edge of the universe, that is actually what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, which happened 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So we're not quite seeing to the edge of the universe, but essentially we are. In the next couple of decades, every galaxy within that volume is going to be mapped out because the universe is now technologically finite. But I hope and I pray that we are smart enough to realize that the sky is, 
is for humanity. It is a human rights, human right of people to be able to look up somewhere on the surface of the earth, up at a dark sky, and wonder what's out there. If we don't do anything to stop the commercialization of space, what we'll see when we look up there are just billboards. Thank you.